Today, I'm going to talk about another theory for how masks can help us in the COVID pandemic, which is the question of the viral inoculum and how that uh, the severity of disease is likely dose dependent. So the quick outline is we're going to talk about why we think masks work to date before we get to this theory. So this is kind of the third reason for why masking could be important. I want to talk about what are the known rates of asymptomatic infection with COVID-19. What do we know about the relationship between viral inoculum and severity of disease? And what's the mechanism by which a high viral inoculum leads to more severe disease? And then have we seen asymptomatic infection over time increase under mask conditions? Um, and then that would translate to in places that mask, is it about cases or when cases go up, does that matter if severe illness doesn't go up? And then we'll talk about the concept of variolation or kind of a poor man's vaccine with masking. You know, the CDC recommended cloth face coverings on April 3rd. And, you know, if you look at their website, it's very interesting. They still have this picture that says, wear a mask to protect others. Um, and I looked just last week and they had updated the message to say, wear a mask on July 31st to protect yourself and others. And they had this helpful visual that like, if no one's wearing a mask, that's terrible. And the best thing you can do is both people wearing a mask, um, but there's gradations and it's still protecting you to wear a mask. But there was no sort of detailed explanation of that. You know, we do know that masks protect you from transmission. Uh, so before we get to the severity of disease question, we know that wearing a mask protects you from transmission. These were two great studies that were published in July. And this left one is from JAMA, where everyone in the hospital system started universally masking in mid-March. So March 25th, actually. Atul Gawanda wrote this like New Yorker article about everyone should be masking in hospitals. And then suddenly the next day, the Boston hospitals all started masking. We started masking in the West Coast three days later. And on March 25th, Fifth, you can see that's the date of universal masking in among healthcare workers in the Boston hospitals. And then over time, you know, the um, this is epidemiologic, but um, the healthcare worker rate of getting SARS CoV 2 went down. And their ecologic explanation was that was related to universal masking. And then there was a JAMA article at the same time by the CDC in the same journal of JAMA saying, yeah, it does protect you from transmission. And then we all know sort of the MMWR report from the end of May, where they opened up hair salons in Missouri, everyone was masked and uh, no one got COVID. Now, to be fair, that isn't actually true. Of 139 clients, only 67 agreed to be tested. And um, the 67 didn't get COVID, the other didn't have symptoms. So maybe they had asymptomatic disease, I don't know, we don't know. But you know, the point being is that Dr. Redfield said on July 14th, if we all masked universally, we could get this pandemic under control in this country for six, eight weeks. So what is the problem with COVID? Why do we care? There are two things that we have to do. The reason that we care about this virus, right, is it's not a typical coronavirus. It doesn't cause a cold. And so there are two things we have to do. We have to decrease transmission, but we also have to decrease the morbidity and make it like, I mean, if we could make it like any other coronavirus, we've just like, you know, defamed COVID. And so it is a huge part of combating COVID-19 to try to decrease morbidity or increase rates of asymptomatic infection because no disease, and Fauci has even said this, there's no disease that has such protein clinical manifestations where you can feel perfectly well or you can die. Like th those are completely massively, you know, protein different clinical manifestations. And how can we decrease the morbidity and get more towards the end of feeling well? So what is the rate of asymptomatic COVID-19 infection right now? It looks, you know, um, with kind of bigger studies and well done studies where you actually test in a mass way, not based on symptoms, and you follow people over time to make sure that they're actually not going to get symptoms, the rate is about 40%. And there was a study in San Francisco that did that. There's a bunch of studies that were put together in a narrative review here in the annals. And then on July 10th, the CDC said, okay, the typical rate of asymptomatic infection, at least on July 10th, is 40% with COVID-19. It may have been it may have been lower before, uh, sorry, yeah, it may have been lower before, but it's about 40% right now. Let's turn to masking and then go back to the rate of asymptomatic infection. We knew in late February and early March, even if we weren't convinced from ecologic data, 
that there's a reason to mask. And that is because this virus spreads and sheds from the nose and mouth at high rates, even if you feel completely well. And it has nothing to do with surfaces. There's no more fomites. I'm not, no one's, you know, many people are not worried about that. The reason it spreads like this is you can feel perfectly well and it sheds at high rates from the nose and mouth. So the reason to recommend masking and the reason that the CDC did that on April 3rd is to say cover that nose and mouth because you could be spreading it to others. The WHO in April actually said, nah, I don't think we should do masking. I'm not sure yet. It, it, we're going to take it away. And, you know, they only actually recommended universal facial masking on June 5th. That was pretty late. San Francisco recommended recommended a mask mandate here on April 17th, tightened the recommendations on May 28th, even like a week ago said even more. Um, and we already talked about the other two studies. So the reason now to think about viral inoculum and what that is, is that masks filter out the majority of viral particles, but not all. So very tight fitting and N95 type masks, masks probably filter out 90 to 95% of viral particles. And then depending on the cloth or the surgical mask formulation you use, the others filter out maybe 70 to 85 percent and we need better studies so they do filter out virus you don't get exposed to so much virus if you're wearing a mask so now the fundamental question of the day is does exposure to less virus less viral inoculum or dose lead to less severe disease and that is what i want to try to convince you of from three big pieces of evidence virologic epidemiologic and ecologic so in terms of virologic evidence you know we have known for many years this is the oldest paper i could find that the viral inoculum that you get in is related to the severity of disease so this is this old paper and it started actually being called the weed and muge theory which is that this was in um, an animal model that the more virus that you gave animals the more likely they were to die and it was called the ld50 um, or the lethal dose 50 that the dose at which 50 percent of animals will die. And that LD50 concept and this concept that the more virus you give, the more sick you get, has been replicated again and again in many animal models. However, we don't tend to give, you know, like viruses to humans and see at the dose at which 50% die. It's, it's not ethical. And so we don't have a lot of human studies. This is one human study though we have. This is from 2015 in clinical infectious disease. And this was a study that was in humans with influenza A, which is an a mortal disease. And so they gave human volunteers in preparation for a vaccine study, higher and higher doses of influenza A. And the less dose you got, the, you would get like a little bit of cough and shortness of breath. And the more dose you got, you got quite sick. And another study that's along these lines is there was a study published in CID just a couple of weeks ago, clinical infectious diseases, where in Switzerland, there were two cohorts of soldiers during the COVID pandemic. And one they kind of did as usual, and 30% uh, of those young soldiers got sick. And then in the other cohort, they either kept them away from each other six feet or they masked. Not both, by the way. And this is another interesting story about social distancing and masking, but not both. I either masked or kept them away from each other six feet, and 0% of those soldiers got ill. And then what do we know from humans otherwise? You know, again, we don't do these kind of experiments, but it just has, if you look at the history of this pandemic, made sense that people got really sick at the beginning when they weren't masking. And by people, I mean healthcare workers. So healthcare workers got super sick in Wuhan and in other settings before that universal masking came to play. And we've universally masked, right, like a month before and anywhere in this country. And then you can just sort of think that more exposure to a high dose before we knew about masking, just kind of historically, Italy and, and, and New York, unwittingly, there was a lot of illness. Household contacts get more ill than those who are away from someone who has COVID. So there's other reminiscent features for why inoculum makes you sicker. And then this was a really nice paper about the influenza pandemic of 1918 that tried to understand why, if you look at that graph on the right, the mortality curve of the second wave was higher because usually in infectious diseases, you have immunity by the time you get the second wave. And so you should have a lower mortality curve. And what they explained it by these authors is that, yeah, actually we were crowding together more. We were, um, you know, it was World War One, and there was a lot more inoculum, a lot more uh, crowding together during the second wave and that may have led to the higher mortality. Okay, so then two final studies before we get to epidemiology. I may have convinced you that this is true of other viruses, but has this been shown with SARS-CoV-2? Two major seminal animal studies. Again, we can't do this with humans, but let's admit that we have two model studies with Syrian hamsters, is the model for SARS-CoV-2 in humans. 
And one is this, it was published in PNAS a couple of weeks ago, which is a Syrian hamster model where the higher the doses the hamsters were given, the more sick they got. So the higher doses are those red lines and you can see there was a higher severity score of illness. So higher inoculum, more sick hamsters. And then this is a, another study in hamsters and CID a couple of months ago where the hamsters were masked. They didn't get tiny little masks on them like this cute picture, but instead they had them under a kind of surgical mask partition. And the masked hamsters, the ones who were simulated masking, not only didn't get COVID if you sprayed SARS-CoV-2 into their cages, but if they did get it, they had very mild disease. They had much milder disease. So um, that was you know, suggested that the masks help protect you from the inoculum. And what is the mechanism of that, by the way? You'll say, why do I, what, what, how can I explain this? In viral infections, where the host immune response has a major part to play in viral pathogenesis, it's really high doses of viral inocula getting in can overwhelm and dysregulate the first arm of the immune system, which is the innate immune response. It's actually why we use dexamethasone and why it's one of the most effective, um, the only effective treatment actually that has been shown to have a mortality benefit with SARS-CoV-2 because you have a really dysregulated immune response when you're given too much viral inoculum. Giving less viral inoculum allows you to have an organized innate and then adaptive immune response to wall up the disease and have more asymptomatic infection. And this has been shown with many, many other viruses. Okay, so if we have virologic evidence for this, if we have convinced ourselves that, that there should be, that we have animal evidence of this, even masked animals get less severe disease, have we seen in humans asymptomatic infection increasing under mass circumstances? It's important to say that we cannot do human experiments like we did with those hamsters, but any of us can remember from high school learning about hypotheses and theories and then proof is that if you cannot prove through a randomized controlled clinical trial, because I think that would be unethical, just like a randomized controlled clinical trial of condoms for HIV prevention would be unethical and we've never done it. We don't need that level of evidence. We need accumulating layers of evidence from multiple bodies of work. So let's turn to the epidemiologic evidence in humans under mass circumstances. This is the tale of two cruise ships. So this was um, a nice kind of setting because cruise ships are closed settings so people aren't coming in and out. And usually you don't let them off if there's an outbreak of COVID-19 under cruise ships. So one of the earliest cruise ships, the earliest cruise ship, got a lot of attention was Diamond Princess. And depending on which study you look at, the rate of asymptomatic infection, no masks in this early cruise ship, we didn't know about masking, was 18%. The rate of asymptomatic infection in an outbreak, not having masks. And then maybe a reanalysis looks like it's a little higher, closer, maybe to 38%. However, this other cruise ship, this is an Argentinian cruise ship, the paper is here, BMJ Thorax, they had an outbreak on board and they also didn't let the staff or passengers off, um, but they did give them all masks. And they gave the passengers surgical masks, they gave the staff N95 masks, and then they did mass testing. And out of 128 of passengers who did get infected, 81% were asymptomatic, so much higher asymptomatic rate. This has been shown in other settings. There's a pediatric hemodialysis unit in Indiana. This was published in JAMA, where everyone seroconverted after a case of a patient. They were all wearing masks and everyone was asymptomatic. And then there was an outbreak in an Oregon seafood processing plant just four weeks ago in a Tyson chicken plant. And all those workers, before they came in the door, were given masks, just like I'm given masks to enter my workplace. And they had to mask in the workplace, but they had outbreaks in both settings. And the rate of asymptomatic infection there was 95%. So much, much higher than the 40% that we saw with the CDC. And then the final piece of evidence is ecologic, right? This is the weakest form of evidence because ecologic means we're looking at big countries and there can lot, be lots of things that happen in the countries. But if you look at countries that were accustomed to masking because they did it early on because they were victims of the SARS pandemic, so Thailand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, Vietnam, Japan, they all took out their masks the minute this happened. And even when they have cases going up, with universal facial masking, they don't have the deaths. They don't have the severe illness. And then I like to point out the case of the Czech Republic because it was not a country that had been influenced by SARS, but it was just a country that sort of decided for themselves on March 23rd, 
put out masking recommendations. Everyone in the country masked, they made them, and they would have openings and they would have cases, but they wouldn't have illness. And then by May 11th, they said, okay, you can take away up your masks. Uh, now we're good. And they've had 352 deaths. They've done great in that country. So this is a model that was published actually quite early on, but this is a model that shows after lockdown lifts, universal masking can keep our death rates low. So this model simulates that, you know, if you just do social distancing after lockdown, they're still going to have uh, deaths. And if you have lockdown, by the way, with nothing, you're going to have deaths because of all the reasons we know why lockdown causes deaths. But if you have 50% masks, then you'll have some deaths. And if you have 80% masking, you can keep the death rate flat. Of course, it implies that you have to have compliance. You have to have compliance with masking. The lockdown has been said many times as a very blunt instrument and uh, masking takes behavior change. And so we, we have chosen to think about trying to enforce behavior change by locking down the entire economy that will lead to severe illness in other ways. So I think we have to turn our minds to thinking about behavior change. And then I'll finish up with San Francisco. Hard to tell. Um, I just live here, so I think about it. I mean, do we have a 60 to 80% compliance with masks? Uh, we do test a lot. We do have a lot of asymptomatic infection in this city. And this is the data as of this morning. I should have said August 6th that we have done this many tests in the city. 275,000, 7,228 cases reported, 63 deaths. Now, if you look at June 27th, which was when things started going up in terms of cases, we were 50 deaths that day and 3512 cases. So we have now 4,000 more cases and 13 more deaths. So you can calculate that case fatality rate, but um, it is it is an interesting question. And I would say that New York, Boston, San Francisco sort of anecdotally are places that mask. And then I will end with an intriguing question on immunity. Is asymptomatic infection horrible? Well, it's horrible. It's led to 18 million cases and counting because you, know, you can spread unwittingly if you feel well and you shed high rates of virus from your nose and mouth. That's no doubt. But that's actually where masks come in. But the hopeful thing about asymptomatic infection is could you get immunity without long-term consequences? Could you actually feel well, have no symptoms, have a cold or something, and you're immune to the scary infection? And that is the question. There's very hopeful studies on T-cell immunity, preventing infection if you've been infected it before, even with asymptomatic infection. And I list some of those studies uh, below with the, with the pictures on the right. And, you know, the most profound way that we think about why COVID-19 causes immunity is that there's been 18 million cases. It's been going on for eight months. And we've yet to see a convincing case of reinfection. If it's happened, they're anecdotal. They're not very well described. And that's going to happen with, by the way, chickenpox or, you know, measles as well. So sometimes you lose your immunity. But this many cases, it's not 18 million, by the way, we all know it's many more, and not having reinfection, this is very hopeful for immunity with asymptomatic infection. And this has led us to write a paper that we recently submitted about the concept of variolation while awaiting vaccination. Remember, variolation was taking that vesicle and scraping it with smallpox and, you know, giving it to some, giving them a little vesicle and giving them very mild infection so they could get immune prior to, to the very effective smallpox vaccination that led to, um, to eradication of smallpox. So, you know, having asymptomatic infection by definition is good for the person. You're not sick. And if it could be good for society because you, you lead to greater population level immunity, and that's a huge benefit of masking. So in conclusion, masking may have more than one advantage. It mitigates transmission, but it also, I think, mitigates morbidity. This is a theory here, but it is kind of building in evidence and based on an old concept from the virologic data. It's hopeful, but it's not that hopeful if we can't wear masks, right? Like it actually requires behavior change. That's why it's not as hopeful in a place like the United States, which is profoundly confused about a simple public health measure, profoundly confused and unevenly following. Masking, if it's as effective as lockdown, um, may have prevented deaths in many places that don't have such a confused relationship with masking um, as places have opened up around the world. And the U.S. may become a natural experiment. Maybe Boston, San Francisco, and New York won't have deaths in Florida. Uh, Arizona and Texas will. And if cell-mediated immunity is triggered with asymptomatic infection, that is hopeful for increasing population level immunity. And should we be masking at home? Yeah, probably. If I uh, if I want to send my child to school, which I desperately do, and I have a, had an old person live with me, absolutely, I think we should be masking at home. So I will end with this picture from 1918, where this little mask was on a little cat. And if your cat can mask, so can you. <laughs>